So welcome everyone uh, to the Dashboard Dojo, the first one in the month of May. Uh, today we're going to talk about reporting from an end user's perspective. And before we get started, I just thought to share a little bit about why I think this is important. So a lot of people use Salesforce reporting in Classic for quite a few years. And, uh, you know, I'm even going to stop my share for this. Um, people used uh, Salesforce reporting for years in Classic, and we made the move to Lightning. And Salesforce recreated a number of the features. And in Lightning, some of the features work differently. And Salesforce also added in new functionality for end users. And it, it started to make me think like, you know, for all the people out there that don't necessarily create reports, but run them, uh, and maybe you don't even have permissions to create reports, uh, you know, out of the box, standard users don't even have permissions to create dashboards, but they can certainly uh, view them and use them. Um, there are quite a few features that have been created for them, and how can we just make sure that the list is clear and, and, and whatnot. So uh, that, that was the inspiration behind today. So thank you for joining. Um, seems like we've got a couple notes. Shilpa's back. Hey, Shilpa, nice to see you from Brussels. That's great. And Tracy's uh, coming in from Maine. Oh, that's always fun. Uh, people from all over the world joining us. This is awesome. All right, so uh, we'll, for the agenda today, we'll just uh, spend one, one, uh, 10 seconds on who I am. Uh, we'll dive into uh, Waza and Shi'ai. I think it's mostly uh, Waza today, just talking through topics, but I, I do wanna do some hands-on, or not hands-on, but demo stuff. Um, we'll talk about the upcoming dojo topics. I am open for ideas for the month of June. Uh, we've got some training coming up in the month of June for OpFocus, and then we'll, we'll take some Q&A. Um, so if, if you haven't uh, met me before, uh, you've probably heard, or if you haven't met me before, you don't know that I, I spent a number of years in Japan uh, a long, long time ago, and it was a big part of just my late teenage and early 20-something uh, years. Uh, I'm the, uh, the founder and chairman and chief evangelist of OpFocus. We're a 50-person consulting shop out of uh, Boston and Toronto. Uh, our team is scattered uh, around the, the US and Canada. We work with SaaS companies to help them optim optimize their revenue operations. Uh, I was uh, very honored to be part of the Salesforce MVP group this year. Um, it's really special. Uh, and if you don't know who the folks are in the, um, the, the little characters on the screen, I am a Studio Ghibli fan. Uh, there's this whole set of movies that I've got three kids and we've just enjoyed them so much. Uh, the big rotund character in the middle, middle is Totoro, in case you didn't know. Um, but even from when I lived in Japan, in fact, one of the characters, the, the girl with the witch, uh, I remember when that movie came out and I remember watching it in Japan. It was probably one of the first movies that I just watched in Japanese because that, that was my option um, way back when. But I didn't realize that Hayao Miyazaki uh, was just such a big phenomenon in Japan and now certainly worldwide. And it's so big that they're actually going to open a theme park near Nagoya uh, based on his characters uh, from the Studio Ghibli films. But uh, anyway, um, so let's dive into today's topic. So um, as always, I think almost every dojo session, we talk a little bit about permissions or settings. Uh, and because so few of the report and dashboard permissions are assigned to profiles or permission sets out of the box, it's important that we start with that today as well, even for end users. Um, we'll talk about search. Now, search seems like one of those silly topics, but there are some differences to how the search works, uh, whether you're on the reporter dashboard tab or using the global search. Um, for an end user, when they go, when they first join your company and they start using Salesforce, they see, you know, what could be piles and piles of folders and piles and piles of reports and dashboards on those tabs. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about how folders work uh, and how we can protect what we create, uh, but also how an end user just navigates the system. Uh, we'll talk about favorites, which is a really nice addition uh, to Lightning. Uh, we'll talk about the report and dashboard tabs themselves. This, they, they made quite a big change with the move to Lightning and I think it's worth understanding a couple of things about how they're, they're organized. Um, exporting is still a big feature. I kind of wish it was not turned on by default for all users. Uh, that's been true since I started working with Salesforce in 2005. Um, it seems a bit too open, in my opinion, to allow everyone to export data, but oh well. Um, uh, we'll talk about subscriptions. So Salesforce has done a really nice job in Lightning. So back in the classic days, we had the ability to schedule 
reports and there was another separate feature to uh, subscribe and what they've done is basically combined the functionality for those two things and expanded upon it in the subscription feature so each user can has the ability out of the box to subscribe to five reports uh, we can also give them the ability to subscribe subscribe to up to five dashboards but that's not on by default um, we'll talk about some of the runtime features, and this is really sort of a, a big area. I think I have 13 things highlighted. So when a user goes and runs a report, there's just a bunch of stuff available to them, especially in Lightning. We have a lot of good things that we should teach our end users about um, how they can get the most out of the reports that have been created for them. Uh, I want to show you inline editing because it's coming out in a couple of weeks, and I was able to get it provisioned in a pre-release org, so I can show you that. Talk about dashboard filters, uh, dynamic dashboards, and then finally, another uh, new summer feature, the ability to download a dashboard as a PNG, which is a, a nice thing that we can do for end users. Um, we've, we already have the ability for somebody to download individual dashboard components, uh, but this uh, ability to download the entire dashboard as an image is uh, coming out in the summer release. All right, so we've got a, a number of topics, but before we get started with that, I'm curious, I think Kyle's teed up a, a poll for us. And thank you again, uh, Kyle, for hosting us today. Um, I'm curious in the last 12 months, have if you're an end user, has anybody trained you in your Salesforce org about reporting features? Or if, if you're a sysadmin or a system owner, have you trained your users uh, about um, features? I'm just, just curious, it's not, uh, there's no shame in whatever the answer is, but just sort of curious. All right, it looks like um, about 70% have provided training for end users and about 30% uh, have not. Uh, so thank you for doing that, that's great. Um, why don't we go ahead and we'll move on from the poll and let's dive in. Um, so uh, if you've seen me present at all in the last two years, you've seen this uh, article before. Um, I, I read a blog article for the admin blog two years ago um, about you know, just the standard user profile, how it only uh, offers four, it's actually 31 perms. I, I miscounted earlier today, so sorry about that. So there are 27 report and dashboard permissions that are not assigned by default to a standard user. Uh, a really big example of that is the ability to subscribe to dashboards. Um, so you actually have to go assign that to a profile or create a permission set uh, with things that you want to add. Uh, this blog article, uh, the uh, Kyle put the uh, the link, just a simple Bitly link to the uh, the article. Um, what I did was define five typical groups of users, um, just regular old end users, and what permissions you might give them. Uh, what additional permissions a, a manager might want. Um, probably the sweet spot for this article is the report and dashboard super users. If you are not an admin in your Salesforce instance, but you're somebody that cranks out reports and dashboards, I wanna make sure that you have access to all the features you should. Another one that doesn't come out of the box is the ability to change dashboard colors. Like if you're working in Lightning and you're creating dashboards, you should be able to create, um, uh, change uh, dashboard colors or manage a dynamic dashboard. There's a number of things like that. Um, so out of the box, the standard user profile allows an end user to create and customize reports, run reports, export reports. Now those three first bullets right there, they allow any user in your company to steal your data. Um, so just, just saying. Um, the other thing that they can do is subscribe to reports. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, the ability to basically choose, uh, you know, like every Monday morning at 8 a.m. To, to be emailed a copy of the report. Um, so uh, I do want you to consider the needs of end users, managers, and super users with how you hand out permissions. Uh, again, if you're an end user or a super user, you might just show this article uh, to your admin and say, can you just make sure I have this level of functionality? All right, let's talk about searches. So. Um, all these uh, searches are not created equal. Uh, there is the global search, uh, which appears at the top of Salesforce. Uh, this has been around forever. It's very powerful. It reaches into a lot of things, but interestingly, it works differently than the reports tab search. So if you use the global search and you search on, I've searched on the word grouped here, 
it found a couple of, or found a report with the word grouped in it. It also found a bunch of reports that have the word grouped in the description. Now, oddly, uh, dashboards does not work that way. Uh, dashboards, it searches the title with this global search, uh, but it does not search the description, not sure why. Um, and then actually on the tab itself, there is another, so if you click on the reports tab or the dashboards tab, there's an embedded search feature in each one of those tabs, and they actually work differently, which is a little crazy. So um, the on the tab itself, the first thing you'll notice is depending on which category you've selected over here on the left, and the default is the recent reports, um, it's, it sub-selects that, it's like a pre-selected search, which is very confusing for end users. So if you have a new head of sales and she comes on board and she goes, logs into Salesforce, goes right to the reports tab and she goes right into search, she's not gonna see anything because she hasn't looked at anything recently. And that search, it's, it can, it's confusing, but it's only searching recent items which for a new user is none, they don't have any recent items. So whichever one of these categories over here on the left and they're grouped by reports, folders, and then favorites down at the bottom, uh, that's the context through which you're searching. And sort of the unusualness doesn't end there. Within that search, it doesn't search using a contains, it searches using a starts with. And so you can see over here on the left screenshot that I'm searching on W slash and it's finding the W slash here and highlighting it, it's finding it here. But if that W slash was in the middle of a word, it wouldn't find it. Uh, so let me actually show you an example of this uh, in action. So I'm here in my uh, demo environment and notice that I've clicked on the reports tab and it's gonna search the recent reports. Now watch if I click on here and change it to all reports, it says the context is shifted to search all reports. It's a really important thing for people to know that that search context is controlled by this uh, set of categories over here on the left. Now, I know that there are reports in the system that have the word emoji in them, but they don't start with the word emoji. There is no word that starts with the word emoji. Um, I do have uh, W slash, and if I search on that, you can see the word emoji is in here, but it doesn't start with the word emoji. So that's what I mean that this is not a contains search. Whereas if I were to search on the word emoji using the global search, it's actually gonna go find the deal size with emoji. But if I search for that word emoji here, it's not gonna find it because it doesn't start with that word. It's also not searching the description like the uh, global search does. So I find that a little confusing. It's just very particular. I do like the highlighting, you know, so if I search on uh, the word data, it's just going to go highlight the word data in all these reports, which is nice. Uh, but again, it does not do anything with the folders, doesn't do anything with the descriptions or the created bias. You need to know the words in the title uh, of the report, the name of the report. All right, so that's the search. Uh, just on the example. Um, so folders, obviously, with the move to Lightning, we've had a really significant change um, with the ability to nest folders up to four levels deep. Uh, I think there was great hope that this was going to simplify things and make life easier. But in a sense, it sort of buried some of the truth, right? Uh, for most users, they have access to way too many reports and dashboards. They have access to all kinds of things that they don't need. And I'd like to, I'd like to make the case that your CEO, she doesn't need to see everything, okay? In fact, I would say she needs to see the least uh, and not be distracted by all the nonsense, the age old stuff from 10 years ago that nobody needs to see. We do not need to let the higher ups see everything. So it's like, please, I give you permission to not like sort of cloud up their report and dashboard tabs. Um, you know, the other part of this that that's hard, you know, when you first click on all folders, all you're seeing is the top level folder and there's no indication how many reports are in each of these folders or how many nested subfolders. There's no indication at the top level. So if I were to click into one of these, I think I've got, if I were to click into this top level folder, uh, there is this rudimentary navigation. You've got some breadcrumbs here, the dot, dot, dot ellipsis. And then I must be in a second level folder, in a third level folder, in a fourth level folder. And this is as deep as I can go. Um, and I can 
uh, follow this back, I could click on third level folder to go up a level and then I could go up another level. Um, but it's not, it's not something that lets you expand and collapse and see everything within the folders. My strong suggestion is to uh, share things out on a, on a need to see basis and also to be very careful about the sharing permissions. So there are three levels of folder sharing permissions. There's view, edit, and manage. And we can make a big, big mistake as a, a report or dashboard writer in giving people edit or manage capabilities that don't need it. So if you create the world's greatest set of reports to support a dashboard, and it's like the most important dashboard in your organization, you put those folders in, uh, so you put those reports, the supporting reports in one folder, you wanna make sure that you only give out view access to that. That allows people to run those reports, that allows people to go see the dashboard, um, but you don't want them to change what's in those folders because it'll end up breaking your dashboard. So we would only wanna give them view access uh, in that case. Uh, and I'd say pretty much anything that's important to you, um, you might give them view only access because most users who can run something, if they wanna create their own copy of it, they absolutely can use the save as and put it in their own private folder. You just don't want them overwriting all the great stuff that you've created. So back in our system, um, if I were to click on all folders here on the reports tab, I can see a list of folders here. And again, I can't tell how many levels. So this must be the one in the screenshot, this top level sales folder. And if I dig in, I can see within that, I have a second level folder and I could have multiple folders and also multiple reports. But if I dig into that, it looks like I don't even have anything in my second level folder. But if I need to go back up a level, I can do that. Click on top level folder, go up a level and so on. All right, so that's how uh, folders uh, work. Uh, favorites is a real fantastic feature within Lightning. I strongly encourage everyone to either embrace it if you're an end user or to teach your users about this. Um, it's very easy to add or remove favorites. Each user can have up to 200 favorited items and, it, and it's much bigger than you think. You can favorite an app, you can favorite a record like a lead or an account, you can favorite a report or dashboard, you can favorite folders, uh, you can favorite list views. There's all kinds of things that you can favorite. And again, each user can have up to 200 items. You can relabel them, you can reorder them. You can see here that to get to my list of favorites, I can click on the down arrow and I can see my list of favorites here and I've reordered these. Um, and you can see there's uh, one report that's favorited and there's one dashboard that's favorited in this particular list, but each, each of us can have up to 200. We can relabel them, we can reorder them. Now, one of the side benefits to favoriting things is that within the tab itself, if you click on the down arrow, you've got a quick access to each of your own favorites. So your, your head of sales, when she comes on board, there are five great reports you've created for her and two dashboards. My strong suggestion would be to sort of lean over her shoulder and say, here, let's favorite each one of these so that they're built right into the system for her. So not only on the tabs themselves are these favorited items embedded, but then also in the, um, the bottom left-hand category, the all favorites, they can see them there. So in my system here, again, I'm on the reports tab. If I click on the all favorites, I've got quite a few reports that I've favorited here. Now these should also be available in, the, in this down arrow. It looks like it's uh, giving me a shorter list uh, of items. You can also see that I've favorited a reports folder as well, and that shows up here. So I think this is pretty cool. Um, very uh, quick access for people that have very important things that they need to see. It works the same with um, dashboards as well. I've got three dashboards that I've favorited for myself here. All right, um, the dashboard tab and the report tab, they're both very similar uh, and they Uh, David, I think your audio cut out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, leave it to me to gesticulate and hit the mute, the little teeny itty bitty mute button on my big microphone here. Um, so, um, you know, we took a look at the reports tab a minute ago. Uh, you've got the categories over on the left. You've got the handful of columns here. We have the ability to add a couple of additional columns. And one that I would encourage end users to take advantage of is the subscribed column. 
Um, for a lot of us over time, we subscribe to one report and three months later, we subscribe to another report. And then we have a third, a fourth, a fifth. And then we have this really amazing report that somebody creates and we want to subscribe and we can't. And sort of like until you unsubscribe from something, an easy way to manage that for an end user is actually to just make sure that the subscribed column is visible. Uh, so we can do that in our system just by going to the tab and it looks like I've already shown it here, but what I could do is click on the down arrow, select the fields to display. One that I like to add is the report last run date and also to show the subscribed column. So what I might do is actually sort these. If you click on the column header, you can sort by uh, you know, either ascending or descending. So it looks like I only have one that I've subscribed to here, but if you already have five, it's an easy way to isolate those five so you can choose one to unsubscribe to. So what else do we have? Depending on your permissions, uh, you have the ability to create a new report or a new folder. Um, you also have the gear here to reset the column widths. Every now and then you need to reset them and it'll sort of resize it based on the width of your browser. Um, we also on the um, both the report and dashboard tabs, we have these action pull downs over to the right. And this is kind of a nice way for people to sort of quickly do something with a particular report, whether it's run it, edit it, subscribe to it, export. Um, if the report is in a folder that somebody has the ability to delete, uh, they'll get the delete option. Uh, for people who have the ability to create or edit dashboards, you can add a report from here. You can also unfavorite, or you can move folder, fol folder to folder as well if the permissions allow it. All right, so the dashboard tab is pretty similar. Um, the, the default is it's a list of recent. The search is related to the recent. Uh, if I switch it to all dashboards, I can see a longer list. The search works the same way. If I search on the word lead, that one that has the word lead in it, but again, it won't search in the middle of a word, uh, it just searches at the starts with. It does not search the description. Um, we do have a subscribe column that we can add. Uh, we can also um, use the action pull down, and it's a pretty similar list for dashboards as well. Uh, David, um, Alexandra had a question around if there are any workarounds for subscribing users to more than five reports, or oh, if great it's question. kind of a hard, yeah, a hard limit. Um, yes, uh, it is a hard limit, and I've asked multiple times, uh, I've asked multiple people on the report and dashboard team at Salesforce, the limit isn't going to change. However, however, um, something that you can still do is you can switch back to classic and use the either the schedule, which allows you to do one per hour per day, something like that, up to some limit or you can use the subscribe feature in Classic. There are, in, in Lightning, it's one feature. In Classic, it's two different features, but they're still available. And those are using a different limit. So, so you could, in effect, get uh, more than the five in Lightning uh, that way. It looks like Laura asked a, a similar question. If someone else subscribed to you, it doesn't display in the subscribe column. I actually think it does, but I could be wrong. Uh, and Laura, I. I it's probably, um, it's been a long time since somebody else has subscribed me to something. So uh, um, I thought it, you know, let me, um, let me, let me tinker with that. I'll, I'll just use a couple of users log in as somebody and, and I'll just tweet it out after the, the session. I'll, I'll just uh, dig into that. Uh, was there another, um, uh, so Lauren asked the question, is there a way to allow someone to see reports in a folder, but not save in it? Yes, so you could allow them view access to the folder that would not allow them to save in it. If you give them edit or manage, then they can save into the folder, they can edit things in the folder. I think view, um, uh, now if you have an instance where somebody still has that ability, even though you've only given them view access, that could be a profile, uh, or permission set thing where they have the ability to manage public folders. So that would be the, the way that somebody could override it if their profile gave them more permissions. All right. Um, I do want to get into the uh, sort of the, the, the big core thing uh, after this topic. 
So very quickly, we do have the ability to export reports, and there are two ways that we can export them. We can export them as formatted, which includes headers and groupings and, and filters and stuff like that, uh, or we can export essentially the raw details only, so the rows and columns. Uh, so depending on exactly what you're doing, you might have a slightly different experience. Like if you're creating a report but you haven't saved it yet, your export experience is different than if you're creating a report, you've saved it, and now you go to export and you have a different set of uh, options available. So if you're looking at a report that's already been saved, uh, you click on the down arrow, click, click export, then you get these two options available to you. Um, so, um, subscriptions, um, you know, we talked about there, each user can have up to five, and this is true for reports and dashboards. Though, interestingly, uh, for dashboards, a regular user does not have the ability to subscribe to a dashboard until you give them that permission. Um, uh, with report subscriptions, you can schedule, uh, schedule them daily, weekly, or monthly. You can choose the day of the week. You can set the time for it to run. So for a head of sales, I might send them um, a, an open pipeline report, maybe an hour before their big pipeline meeting for the week, or maybe you know, 7 a.m. that day so they can look, look at it before their big meeting. Um, you have the ability to do an optional attachment. So that was added in the last year in Lightning. Uh, you can also set the conditions um, to be, uh, say, only get emailed if it's above a threshold or below a threshold. Uh, which is a really nice feature. It's not new to Lightning. That existed um, in the, uh, the old subscription feature in Classic, uh, but it resurfaced in Lightning and can be great. Like, let's say that, you know, I only want to be notified uh, if there is more than 10 priority one customer cases at an, any one time. And so if you set this to be a daily report at 8 a.m., you would only receive that if there was more than 10 open priority one cases. With dashboards, there's a little fewer uh, capabilities. Uh, again, it's up to five per user, and you have the ability to uh, uh, set the schedule and add recipients. What the user receives in either case is essentially an HTML version. If there are links in there, which there usually would be to records, if they click on it, they, the user still has to authenticate to get into Salesforce uh, to see the actual report or dashboard. All right, so there's quite a few things to talk about on the actual report itself. So if I were to go run any report, I've got a long list of items here that I want to talk about. So the first is, which report type was this created on? This is such an important thing. Um, we're going through a significant change at OpFocus. We've just implemented a new PSA tool. And you know we need to figure out, is this report that's on projects, so PSA is, is professional services automation, so we're a consulting shop. We manage projects and have time and resources and stuff like that. It's very important to know, what, what am I looking at? So if I look at a report, it could have been created 10 years ago using an earlier functionality, but I can tell based on the report type, and that's right up here, the number one. So that any user that's running a report, somebody, a new head of sales, you know, if they just want to understand what it is they're looking at, the report type is a nice clue. You can see it in the run environment. If you edit the report, you can also see it up in the top left as well. It appears in a gray oval. Um, there is a, a feature that I don't even know if I've ever played with before, which sounds funny, um, is this number two up here that there's a little search thing. And it's interesting how this actually works. So if I go run a report, and let me try to pick one that has some data in it. Um, uh, maybe I'll pick a recent one because I know there's data in the recent ones. All right, so I'm looking at this simple report. It's got a thousand accounts grouped by industry. And uh, this is the, uh, rec uh, the report type up here in the top left, the accounts report type. But what I wanted to talk about now is this search feature here. It says search report table. Now, if I added a chart to this, it's not searching the chart, it's searching the table below. And if I were to come in here and search on the letters AZ for Arizona, it's found 66 of them within the report. Uh, if I were to search on 937 for this uh, 
I don't know why I picked up some of these other ones, nine. Okay, there we go. Uh, so it, it found, so this search, unlike the search on the reports tab itself, this search actually does a contains, it finds direct something even within uh, a text field. So I think this is pretty great. Whatever columns you have here, it's looking through that. Uh, let me see if it finds the modified date. So 325, it found that as well. So this is, seems pretty powerful, this search feature. I had not used that before. Um, another one that's in here is uh, the ability to add a chart. So it's very easy for an end user to add a chart. We're not editing the report. We're in the runtime environment for the report. And I can add a chart as an end user or remove the chart. I don't have to edit it. So in classic, we used to have to, all right, I'm gonna reload this to get rid of the search. Uh, in classic, you used to have to edit the report to add a chart. Uh, we don't need to do that in lightning. We can just go ahead and click the add chart. It gives us a horizontal bar by default, but I can go ahead and switch that and make that you know, some other type uh, pretty easily. And there are a couple of other things that we can do to change the properties, give it a title. Um, we can change the colors. We can show a reference line. Like let's say we only were interested in industries where we have more than uh, 15 accounts. I can put a reference line, maybe you know, I'll do 25, let's do that. And let's make the reference line red. So it's, it's pretty nice what we can do, uh, pretty straightforward um, to just add some extra functionality here, add some visual uh, cues on here. Now we're not, we're not done. Another couple of things we can do, we can hover over chart elements. We can also click on them. So the hover over is pretty straightforward and it gives me some information, including a percentage. If I were to click on that, all the others go gray and the data down below is filtered by that item in the chart that I clicked on. I really like that myself. There is no real obvious undo button, but I found out over time, if you actually click on the same chart segment, it undoes it and reruns the report, uh, which is nice. Um, another thing we should teach end users is the uh, ability to take a look at what the filters are. So if you are an end user on our call today, um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if somebody's created the world's greatest report for you and you're just trying to make sense of it, like this report type, what report type is it created on is important. I would also personally click on the filters here and just see what are the filters? Is this showing me all accounts in the system? In this case, the answer is yes. Or is it showing me something else? So if I were to run another report here, uh, let's look at my open ops. And uh, that's not the one I wanted. I think I had. Okay, well, you can see here on the different reports that the filters just show up depending on what you put. Every now and then there's a filter in here with a lock on it. Those are ones that the end user cannot change. But in this case, as an end user, I can go ahead and play with this. Like clearly I have no open opportunities. Well, maybe I wanna see somebody else's opportunities. So I can go ahead and play with these filters and notice that I haven't saved the report. I'm just using the report that somebody gave me and sort of tinkering with it. So it, let's look at all opportunities. We're looking at ones that are open. Maybe I wanna look at the ones that have a close date in the next month or the current fiscal quarter. Let's do that. And so I'm zeroing in, you can see the grand totals updating up here. Uh, maybe I wanna add one more thing. So notice that I'm not adding filters, I'm just using the filters that have been given to me here. Um, and I can go ahead and, and sort of make the report my own. Um, this is where it's probably a good time to talk about the save as feature and a good time to talk about um, protecting your reports. So if you've created a great set of reports, I would put them in a folder that's view only and not allow people to overwrite what you've done, they can always uh, save as, if they have the ability to create reports, they can save, use the save as and put it in their own private reports folder. Uh, and that's what I'd encourage people to do if they're creating their own variations. Like I might want to um, look at this for this month, this week, this quarter and save those three variations. I could do that very quickly by tinkering with the filters and just continuing to save as. Um, another feature in here is the ability to refresh. Uh, and this you don't see used as often, but we're gonna see it with the summer 21 feature of the inline editing. When you use the inline editing, 
you make the change and it, it doesn't actually show you the change. So you need to click the refresh to see that the change has actually occurred. Um, um, if, you're, if you have permission on the report to edit it, you have the edit button. Um, you also have a pull down here of other things that you can do. Now, um, on these reports, I'm going to pick another one that has um, a grouping. Um, when a report has a grouping, we have the ability to add a chart. We also have these toggles down on the bottom left. So the ability to expand and collapse details. So I might want to collapse the details and just look at the summary by, by the groupings. Um, I can choose to show or hide the subtotals. I can hide the grand totals if I wish, if I wanted to get rid of, if I had other grand totals here. I could get rid of that. Um, a couple of other features that are not quite as obvious. One of them is the ability to drill down. So for an end user, they have the ability to check a box or check a box or check a box. And then a new button appears with the ability to drill down. And literally, I'm now just going to look at these 112 accounts. Not, it's, sort of, it's sort of adding the additional filter and literally allowing me to zoom in. Um, and so it's, it's saying also when I do this, do you want to keep the grouping the same? So I could choose to group it by something else if I wanted to. But this uh, drill down feature allows us literally to just literally zoom right in and look at a specific subset. And I could do it again. Maybe I just want to look at the agriculture and I could zo zoom in on those. So it's giving me the, the drill down capability by the grouping, in this case, which is industry. Uh, but it's another nice feature that's available to us. Um, a couple of others. One is the ability to sort. And you have that. You can see the arrow on the column that is currently sorted. See the gray arrow here? If I click as an end user on that down arrow, I can choose the sort. Uh, sorry, change the sort. I can also um, choose to sort it in a totally different way. I might change, change it instead of alphabetically uh, to sort by the record count or something like that. Um, users also have the ability to pull down, change the sort on any of the columns, uh, make a column a grouping, or even remove a column um, in the version of the report that they're looking at. Again, this is another reason why we don't necessarily want to let people edit these great reports we've created, but instead um, put them in a view-only folder and they can go, go crazy and play, you know, make changes that they want and save them privately somewhere else. All right, um, so we talked a little bit about toggles, drill down, sorts, sorts, chart segments, hovers, action pull down. It looks like we got through most of those, which is good. Um, I did mention creating a copy of a report. We want to encourage users to use the save as and create their own private copy. So every user who has access to the reports tab can save things into the private folder. That's their own personal space. Uh, they can put things into what's called a public folder. In classic, that was the unfiled public reports. Um, so they could, if they've been given permission, put thing, something into a shared folder uh, if you want them to. Um, so why would we protect folders? I, I mentioned earlier to protect key reports, to protect reports that are uh, sourcing dashboards. Um, also, if you have reports or dashboards that are embedded, you definitely don't want to put those in folders that people can edit. Um, so in the OpFocus system, we have a sales dashboard. When somebody logs in, it's right on their homepage. That is an embedded dashboard. That dashboard sits in a folder that's view only to most of the team. We just don't want anybody changing something that's been set up for a very specific purpose. Um, so um, I did want to show off inline editing. So this is a feature that a lot of people have waited for for a while. It doesn't work exactly the same as inline editing on list views. In fact, there are a couple of notable, notable differences. So when the summer release comes out in a couple of weeks, you will need to submit a feature request. This is a beta, and it's a beta that requires you to submit a case. Um, and you're going to submit a very specific case for you know, enabling inline editing and reports. Um, so once that's been enabled, there's then a checkbox that you can check. And I'll show you that right now. So. Uh, looks like I'm using Firefox for that instance. So in the instance, this is a trial org for a pre-release for the summer 21. And under setup, feature settings, analytics, 
reports and dashboards, report and dashboard settings. This is the checkbox that will turn it on. Again, you have to submit a case when the summer 21 release goes live, you'll submit a case to enable the beta. And then once it's enabled, then, or once the beta is available to you, then you have to go enable it and then you can go use it. And if we were to go look at it, um, I've got a simple report here. It is a limited number of data types uh, that it works with. The columns that it doesn't work with, you'll see a gray um, uh, lock padlock. So account owner doesn't work, that's a lookup. Account name doesn't work. Billing state is a pick list, doesn't work. It's part of the address block. Prospect is a pick list, doesn't work. Dates doesn't work. Industry doesn't work. Okay, it looks like we don't have a lot of choices on this one, except for employees, which is a numeric. So because this is a numeric, I am able to see the pencil and edit. Uh, and for some of you, it's probably the first time seeing this. So if I were to change that to 10,000 employees, and click save, it tells me that the field was updated, but look, I don't see the update here. This is where that refresh button comes in. And if I were to refresh it now, it'll show me the change. Um, when you use this feature, validation rules are applied. You will see a red uh, bar if, if you're doing something that isn't supported. Um, unlike list view inline editing, it doesn't seem to care about record types at all. Um, so with inline editing on list views, you can't do it unless, you know, if, if record types is enabled, if the list view isn't filtered per record type, but that doesn't work this way with reports. Um, I might have one more report where this is enabled just to show another um, use of it. Uh, so this is a collapsed report. Oh, no, no, this has just got a, um, it's a matrix. So I'm just looking down here to see if I can do it. You know, let me get rid of the chart. Too many things on my screen. Okay. Uh, so if we come down here, it looks like I can do probability. It looks like I can do amount. You do want to be careful with opportunity amounts. Um, it, it looks like it lets you update the amount, but if there are multiple products or if there are any products on the opportunity, it looks like it saves, but it just ignores the change you make. So I did some, some tests with um, one with products and one without products and confirmed that um, it really shouldn't allow us to update the amount. And with the inline editing, it does, but it doesn't save it. So this one has products. If I go ahead and save it, it tells me it was updated. Uh, but if I refresh it, it's not updated. It just reverts. So there's a couple of things I think for them to work out with this, but it's still an exciting thing to come for us. All right. Uh, oh, okay. So it looks like Lauren said that um, users can add favorites to main menu tabs. That's great. There's so many things that you can favorite. It's really well done. Uh, uh, so it looks like Alexandra asked the same question about workarounds to subscribing users to more than five reports. Um, so the ability to jump back to class, like that's not going to change. I do not think they allow us to, to purchase additional subscriptions. Um, Emily asked the question, if we create the report with customizations like charts and colors and we add that to a dashboard, what is the best way to allow end users to view yet keep them from inadvertently changing the dashboard? Okay, so that's the save it in a folder that's view only. And then they they will not be able to change unless unless their profile allows them to do other things. So if their profile allows them to do other things, my view only solution isn't good enough. Um, this is where you get into report naming, report descriptions, saying this is a dash, dashboard report. Keep your paws off. Don't edit this. Um, uh, Lauren asked the question: Can you edit a non-system calculated field? Non-system calculated date field. Date field. Uh, it looks like we cannot do date fields in the inline editing yet. Um, so just text numbers, check boxes, and no multi-line. All right, Ted asked the question. Hey, Ted, hope you're doing well. Uh, do you have a feel if Salesforce will expand the functionality? I think so. You know, when Salesforce rolled out role level formulas, well, while it was in the pre-release, I noticed immediately that it didn't support pick lists. And I sort of went nuts. I'm like, why would they ever do this if it doesn't support pick lists? And they, they added it when it went GA. They added the support for pick lists. So if you do have specific things, Ted, um, like the question about dates, um, 
you know, th this is a heavy engineering feat to give this inline reporting capability. You're talking about multiple objects. Um, I, I think the expectation for a lot of us was that this would support multi-line editing and it clearly does not. I don't know if that's part of the, the, the GA roadmap or not, but if there are specific things, I'd let them know. It's a really nice team of people uh, that are working to add these features. All right. Uh, let's... So a couple of other things that I think end users should know about. One of them is dashboard filters. Um, this is one of those features that I wished I played with five years earlier. It's just so nice to be able to just give a little extra functionality. Uh, we can have up to three per dashboard and you might pick like a pick list field or a date and just add some additional functionality to zero in uh, on data on a dashboard. So the dashboard filters are created by an admin or a user who has edit dashboard permissions. Um, they're very simple to add and they apply to dashboard components on the particular dashboard that have related fields. Um, you can have just one filter, you can have multiple filters um, and uh, the filters, filter filters, the filters are also remembered. So if you always look at the agriculture, uh, agriculture industry in the country of China and you click away and you click back, the filters are remembered. So. Uh, Jeannie says, uh, the dashboard filters are great for presentations. I, I agree with you on that. Um, if we just took a quick peek at that functionality, um, I have my favorite old play dashboard, which I think some of you have seen before. Basically, uh, a million years ago, I took the same report and created 20 different views of the same report. This is literally one report. And I just thought, oh, what if I do it this way? What if I show it as a table? What if I show it as a funnel? So this is a report on open industries. Looks like I might've added something else, but open ops by industry and stage. And if I were to use this filter, so there are two here on this dashboard, you can have up to three. And we have one for the billing country. And if I were to choose Canada, it just reruns the dashboard for each of the components that have that field uh, represented. And I could also, um, you know, further filter this with agriculture if I wanted to, and it just, the intersection between those two. I really like this. Uh, just a nice way to give a little extra. Um, you know, if you wanna take a step towards something even a little cooler, especially for a sales pipeline, you could add a date filter. So a filter on the close date, and you can use relative terms like, show me the, our open pipeline with a close date of this week, this month, this year, this quarter and just have a bunch of filters there that allow you to look at that. Uh, great. Um, another one that I really encourage us to share with end users is the ability for dynamic dashboards. So the ability to use dynamic dashboards. Um, so within an enterprise system, you can have up to five total dynamic dashboards. Um, and the way that these manifest is if I were looking at a dashboard that is set up as dynamic, uh, the little change link appears. So if my permissions allow it, I will see, and if it's set up this way, I see the word change and I can change essentially the running user from Lara Garza to someone else. Um, so there are two permissions that are required. One is view my team's dashboards and that will give them the ability to uh, change the running user to somebody below them in the role hierarchy. So if I'm a mid-level sales manager and I've got, or mid-level sales director, and I've got two sales managers and each has 10 sales reps beneath them, I could potentially change um, uh, the, I could use dynamic dashboards to change to potentially, you know, 20 some odd people below me uh, in the role hierarchy. So um, if you want somebody to be able to, to take advantage of this, you've also, or if you want somebody to be able to add uh, or to make a, a dashboard dynamic, there is another profile permission for manage dynamic dashboards. And this is one that I would suggest giving to a report and dashboard super user. So when using these, uh, if you update the running user and you say, view the dashboard as the dashboard viewer and let the dashboard viewer uh, choose who they view the dashboard as, if you were to choose this combination, it would run as themselves as the running user and they see the change link and they can change it to someone else. 
So that particular one might be, that particular combination might be good for a player coach who is a salesperson, sales leader who's selling and has a team of people beneath them. All right, uh, that's dynamic dashboard. So if we just take a peek at that, I think I've got one in here. Uh, it's not the most beautiful dashboard, but it'll do. Um, and you can see the change link here. And if I were to come in here and actually just click on change this, so I can change this to run as Laura Garza, click apply, and it runs it as her. And we can see that she's now the running user. And the way that we did that behind the scenes as, a, as an administrator or somebody with dashboard edit permissions, I just come in here, go uh, edit the dashboard, go to the gear, and then view the dashboard as me or another person. In this case, I chose the dashboard viewer and then let the person override it. Uh, very cool. All right. So uh, another thing that I think we should teach end users about dashboards is the ability to download dashboard components. So this is a really simple one. Um, so individual components, this has been around for, uh, I think, a couple of years, the ability to click this expand link and the, um, or this expand icon and the chart gets bigger and it's on top of a grayed out dashboard below. And then you have this little icon to essentially download the dashboard and um, that lets you download it as a PNG. Um, uh, the other thing that you can do with this feature is you can toggle through the dashboard. So if I were to come in here, this is not the right dashboard to do this with. Let's go back to the last one. And if I were to come in here and pick this uh, funnel, I clicked on that to expand it. Everything else is grayed out. Now I can download it easily by clicking this, or I can actually toggle through the entire dashboard. Uh, it's a little silly for some of the things like metrics that they just look huge, but um, so in the uh, summer 21 release, uh, something that Salesforce has given us is the ability to download uh, a PNG for the entire dashboard. So if I were to go run this dashboard, uh, we now in the summer 21 release have this ability to download and it downloads the entire dashboard as a PNG and I can go ahead and save the file and then go up and just look at this as a preview and it's just a, a nice uh, full graphic of the entire dashboard. So you have that ability for individual components now and in the summer 21 for the entire dashboard. All right, um, so we talked about a lot of stuff, permissions, search folders, playing favorites, reports and dashboard tabs, exporting reports, subscriptions, some of the runtime features. We played with inline editing, dashboard filters, dynamic dashboards, and talked about downloading dashboards and components. Um, on the 26th, we'll do the dojo session on reporting for sales leaders. So hope you can join us. Really, again, aimed from the end user perspective of this is what a sales, user, sales leader should uh, sort of expect to take advantage of in Salesforce. If you have other topics, please uh, either send me an email or um, uh, drop it into the, the chat. Always looking for ideas. I uh, mentioned earlier, we have two upcoming classes, June 14th to 18th, uh, our five-day, the OpFocus five-day admin class that I'll teach. And then I'll also teach a two-day reporting workshop, June 22nd and 23rd. Uh, and let's get to q and I know there's more questions in here. So thank you for the comment, Lauren. I don't know why I cannot make my chat window bigger. Ah, oh, this is maddening. Oh, there we go. Okay, finally. Uh, so Lauren asked the question, if users click into backup reports and the reports will retain the dashboard filters too. If users click into filters too. Oh, oh okay, that's good. Um, uh, thank you, Shilpa, and thank you, Lauren, for your comments. Oh, that was not a question. Thank you, Lauren, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think this is where chat gets used in different ways. Um, trying to see if I've missed other, other questions. Uh, looks like in the Q&A, uh, could you please list all the limitations around reports and dashboards? Shilpa, I can't, it's, there's too many. Uh, um, you know, there, there are things that you expect with a BI tool. So Salesforce sells Tableau CRM, they sell Tableau. There are other BI tools out there that have a whole list of other things that can be done. So uh, we could probably spend a good amount of time talking about what that Delta is um, that we can't do. Um, so Tim, so uh, Tim asked the question, so in this different, Oh, is this different from list views? Yes. And that was one of the first things I was interested in when I 
sort of teed up the pre-release that this is not the same. It doesn't work the same as list views. Um, so you said in that you can update fields for multiple objects. So that is one big difference. So with a list view, you can update fields on that one object for that one list view. Um, whereas with this inline editing of reports, you could have multiple objects uh, that you're uh, inline editing. Um, Emily asked the question, are we capped at the number of dashboards we can subscribe to? Yes, the limit is five. And that feature is not turned on by default. So regular standard users do not have the ability to subscribe to dashboards unless an, you or an admin give them permissions to subscribe to dashboards. Just wondering if we might suffice as a workaround for report subscription caps. Yeah, certainly you could, if you've, if you've maxed out on the individual up to five report subscriptions, you could potentially have a dashboard that's just a single report result or chart, uh, and that could work the same way. Um, thank you for the nice note, uh, Zenobia and uh, Mary Ellen, that's great. Um, well, I guess we're coming up to the, the end of the, uh, the hour. I'm so glad that you all joined us and uh, hope to see you at the next uh, Dashboard Dojo session. So May 26, reporting for sales leaders. Uh, until then, you know, either find me on, on um, uh, Twitter or LinkedIn or, or, or shoot me an email. Uh, Laura asked if you could quickly go to the class slide one more time. Oh, sure. Thank you for, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, Kyle, we may need to update this link. Uh, I don't know that that's the right link anymore, but if you go to the OpFocus site, there's up in the top right, there's a learning with us section and you can find the, um, so Emily just said, if we have non-Salesforce users, oh, the great question, Emily. So who would be interested in seeing dashboards on a daily or weekly basis? So we cannot send, we cannot subscribe a non-Salesforce user. This is how they get you to buy licenses. But what you could do is have your own subscription, have it come to you, and then you could turn around and email it to those users. Um, so that's one way of sharing that out. They wouldn't be able to click on the links. Um, but I, I actually did that for years with our, um, we had a, an outsourced controller and there were a couple of uh, metrics he was very interested in. We put them on a dashboard uh, once a month. I they'd be sent to me and I would just turn around and email it to him. So he didn't have access to our Salesforce system, couldn't click on any of the links, but could see the data. All right. Um, uh, well, uh, it's really been a pleasure, a lot of fun. Uh, I feel like I talked too much and I'm looking <laughs> forward to getting back to some the, 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 the blend of hands-on stuff. But next time we'll do another session, just again, thinking of the end user, but in this case, the sales, uh, the sales leader and what their needs are. So hope to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and Shilpa asked about the recording. Yes, we'll post the recording. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again. <laughs>